we will talk about the role of the project manager, what are the competencies of the project manager, and to what extent should the project manager be the technical expert. Now in terms of what I cover in project management, I really try to be broad based. I try to cover uh, all of what modern project management is considered to be, and that includes the management of scope, what we're going to deliver, management of time, which is the schedule, management of cost, which is obviously budgets and cost control, uh, management of communication, management of stakeholders. You see, there's the mechanics of project management, which are really the mechanics of time and cost and to some extent risk. Uh, there's also the soft aspects, which are dealing with people and human resources and teams and customers and stakeholders. We try to cover both. So welcome to uh, Project Management APS uh, 1001. Uh, by the way, I, I was saying to some of you earlier that <clears throat> we are taking a video of the first, I don't know, hour or so of this course because the, uh, the department is planning to post YouTube videos on a YouTube channel uh, to promote uh, the department and the, uh, the courses. Now that's the civil engineering department, but this is not a construction management course. It is generic project management that's applicable to all disciplines of engineering and any disciplines that are not engineering. <coughs> um, the course has been around since 2007. <coughs> it, uh, it's an offshoot, uh, well here at University of Toronto I mean, in, in the MEng program. <coughs> it's an offshoot from professional development training that my friends, my colleagues and I have been doing for some years. Um, the course uh, you'll see is different from other engineering courses. It is a quantitative course. Uh, there'll be very little calculations. In fact, I, has, I, I dare to say that this is the first course where it will occur that your instructor suggests that in solving some of the problems I'll put up, that counting on your fingers may work as well as using a calculator. Uh, we're going to be talking about, it's not research oriented. Well, in a sense, you will be researching an actual project and looking for lessons learned. Uh, but we're not researching into the leading edge of project management. We're addressing uh, best practices or good practices uh, in project management. Uh, uh, well, and, and with a global aspect because the, the framework that we're going to use is contributed to by people around the world. I'll, I'll tell you about that framework in a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> so to introduce myself for a moment, <clears throat> um, my project management background is in industrial engineering and construction projects from 1974 until uh, about 1994. I was directly involved in the on-site construction management of pulp and paper mills, sawmills, food plants, uh, uh, the steel industry, a little bit on commercial projects. <coughs> um, partly on-site construction management, first on-site construction management and then in engineering offices and project management offices doing project management and also project controls. Project controls is you could think of it as a subset of project management or you could think of it as the mechanical parts of project management intensely interested in estimating, cost control, scheduling and those other kinds of services are what we call uh, project controls and I try to give you a flavor of project controls here particularly cost control and uh, uh, scheduling. <coughs> the companies I worked for were uh, one of two types. One was multidiscipline consulting engineering firms where I happened to work in the project management and construction management practice of those firms. And uh, another kind of firm I worked for was, uh, although we were uh, listed as consulting engineers, we didn't actually do any engineering. We just did the professional project management of capital facilities for uh, clients. Now I'd like to think that uh, we followed pretty good project management practices <clears throat> and in any case in, 19, um, in the late 1980s I encountered the Project Management Institute and there I found that there was an emerging body of knowledge and there was an emerging designation and I've been in, involved with the Project Management Institute ever since. I will introduce you to their framework and I will say a few words about their designation for anybody who may happen to be interested in the future. I'm also connected with the American the Association for the Advancement of Cost Engineering. It's based in the United States, but it too is global. It's particularly interested in cost and schedule management issues. And I'm involved in the Project Management Association of Canada, which is the Canadian constituent of IPMA, which is the International Project Management Association, an umbrella over a number of other uh, associations. Since 1994, I've had my own firm. My partners and I do um, 
do corporate training in project management and a couple of other disciplines, including business analysis. And we do uh, corporate uh, consulting. So we consult with companies on their project management methodologies. We, we facilitate uh, uh, planning sessions. We do benchmarking assignments, uh, these sorts of things. And I'll, I'll draw upon some of those experiences when I'm illustrating uh, uh, stories. Uh, and of course, I instruct this course here. Uh, sometime, I don't think it's going to happen during these eight days, but I do have a backup instructor in my firm who, has to, who will fill in any time that I can't be here with you. So here in the uh, introductions, uh, we'll introduce the nature of the course. Um, um, I'm going to find out a little bit about you. Uh, we're going to talk about the nature of the course, the history of project management, where does it come from, very, very briefly. And we'll start to get, and we'll, oh, we'll set the context of project management in the context of portfolio management and program management and a bit about PMI's framework. Uh, but, uh, but first, uh, have a look at these bullet points. Uh, some of you who have uh, work experience or are currently working on projects may recognize some of these. <clears throat> these are uh, things that project managers bring to us as issues. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> when you see a slide that has an X in the lower right-hand corner, it means it's not actually in your, uh, in your handout. <clears throat> uh, the scope or the requirements of the project, we find out later on, were not clearly defined. This is dist happens distressingly often. Uh, another way to say the same thing, because this is so, uh, uh, um, it's so not unusual, is we didn't really know what the customer actually wanted or maybe it's more likely the customer didn't really know uh, what they wanted. And this one is related to it. Probably because of the first two bullet points, we allow the scope to change. Now, changing scope of a project itself is not a bad thing. Changing the scope may add value to the customer. Hey, it may give us more work. But sometimes we let the scope change without signifying what the impact that's going to have on cost and schedule. And we'll I'm going to illustrate that with a somewhat amusing video clip. I don't know if it'll be this afternoon or it'll be tomorrow morning. <clears throat> uh, it's, <clears throat> it seems universally common that organizations that do multiple projects, and I say this both from, an, from lots of anecdotal evidence as well as from uh, uh, research in project management, that organizations approve and proceed with more conflicts than they have the resources to, uh, 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 to support. When we say resources, we could be meaning all kinds of resources like money and facilities, but usually we most mean people resources. <clears throat> um, studies show that uh, projects that don't do well, projects that fail, uh, insufficient project planning was probably a large part of it. That's why project management puts a huge influence, uh, a huge uh, importance on project planning. A lot of what we're going to be talking about is aspects of project planning. <clears throat> Uh, for internal projects, particularly business and technology projects, lack of commitment by the users who are going to use it is a significant source of uh, uh, problems. Uh, again, for internal projects, lack of pro top management commitment to the project and the importance of the project. Uh, this is related to planning. Sometimes uh, we as project managers are... Uh, um, pressured by our customer or manager, whenever I say customer, by the way, it could be an internal customer to our organization or it could be external, uh, we're often pressured to come up with an, an arbitrary scope and here's your budget and here's your schedule. Got to have it by this time. Well, what about the idea of developing the scope and figuring out what it's going to cost and how long it's going to take? Um, uh, and then perhaps a, a bit of negotiation and, and come up with a scope and a cost and a time that is actually achievable rather than, uh, rather than unrealistic. We will talk about the role of the project manager, what are the competencies of the project manager, and to what extent should the project manager be the technical expert. Let that filter in your mind a little bit. We'll get to that conversation uh, a little bit more <coughs> this morning. Uh, another thing that in studies shows uh, it, it may be uh, uh, resulting in a failed project, and this is more likely to be internal projects, is a weak business case. <clears throat> um, business case is something that we're not going to be addressing here. Uh, just to, put project, to start to put project management into context, we're interested in 
project management. We're interested in, from the time that an internal or external customer comes to, to us with a request for a project, then through gathering requirements and developing scope and developing the cost and the time and the rest of the project plan, through delivering it, monitoring and controlling, changing when required, through to delivering the result that we promised, which was to the requirement. Now, its f business case and benefits is hugely fundamentally important, but we're not going to count it uh, as part of project management. Maybe you and your job will be responsible for the larger scope here, uh, but we're not addressing how we can justify a project, and we're not going to be focusing on whether the benefits are achieved. Now, that may seem like a huge shortcoming, and in the organization, that whole span has to be addressed. Uh, but we're going to be talking about, in our scope here, project management goes from there to there. This will come up for further conversation. Now, <clears throat> before I go any further, I should ask you all, why are you here? May I have some volunteers to tell us why you're here in this course? I'm Rebecca. Oh, well, I'm actually at the junction in my life where I'm searching for jobs right now, and all the websites I have looked into ask for project management, and all the jobs have project management as one of the main criteria. So I want to learn some of the techniques and some of the skills required to be a good project manager. Uh, there's Project management has, been, has historically been known as the accidental, pro, uh, the accidental profession. Um, I'm in a job where I think I'm doing one job, but then it turns out, hey, a project has emerged, and I'm going to be managing that project. And then I realize that project management is actually a discipline, and it's a framework of tools and processes that I can learn. So, and, and I purposely try to structure the course so that we do encourage people who are working and part-time and uh, who hopefully will be willing from time to time to give us an illustrative anecdote or ask some question relevant for you that's going to be relevant for the rest of us. Other reasons? Yes. My name is Michael Gallup. Uh, I've been working now for about eight years, and uh, I so slowly came to the realization that project management is a profession in itself. Uh, right now I'm a practicing engineer, and I, I really feel the need that uh, the science of project management is, is something I need to learn and it's something I want to actually pursue as a profession. So uh, I'm pretty excited to learn this stuff in uh, Professor Carndale's class. Engineers almost always end up in management of one sort or another. It's very commonly project management. Almost all engineers, even early in their career, are working on projects. Uh, and even if you have no intention of becoming a project manager, knowing how your work fits into the larger context of a project, I would say, would be valuable. Now, given that, you, you will find that of work that you're doing, whether it's a more operational work or you know, big project work, a lot of your work is, in fact, going to be at coordinating with other people and getting things done. So that will be a project. So project management skills will be relevant. <clears throat> and many of you will, I predict, fall yourself, you know, find yourself in a, pro in a serious project management role and even a project management career path. Uh, more organizations that are more sophisticated in project management, because probably they're more project-oriented, uh, may tend to have a cr uh, separate career path. For example, uh, uh, AMEC allows me to put up a slide of theirs. I don't have it with me right now, but we probably will sometime in the next uh, few days. A slide showing that you know, somebody can follow a, a technical career path and become a senior technical person, not manager. You could follow a project co controls career path. You could follow a project management career path. You could follow a general engineering management career path. And you could follow a commercial career path. And in fact, what they really like is somebody who's able to move around between those career paths before settling on their own. And um, sadly, some technical people fall into management roles who really aren't appropriate for it it would have been better for them to have a company that encouraged them in a senior technical role as opposed to uh, sometimes awkwardly fitting into a project management role. Many of us will graduate and start in a very technical role and then have to take on some coordination and sort of the edge of management role and, and one can't help but do some of that. For example, you mentioned civil engineering. And if in fact you're off 
either interfacing with the, with the construction sites or there directly, even if you're in more of a technical role, you're still going to want to know about contracts and types of contracts and scheduling and cost control because you're dealing with those contractors. Now at some point, if some, you know, at some point trying to straddle both those worlds, uh, an engineer may decide that uh, to do what Harold Kersner rec uh, recommends. Harold Kersner is a prominent textbook author, project management textbook author. He started as an engineer, well, he, spent, he had a career as an engineer in the aerospace and defense industry in the United States. And uh, at one point he was making a conscious shift over to the project management career path and his boss said, Harold, throw away your engineering books. Well, maybe that was a bit of an exaggeration. But the point was now, you've got to let go of some of, I'm not saying that this applies to all of you all the time, but uh, at some point somebody may have to say, I've got to let go my hold on the, en on the technical because now that I'm a project manager, I will have other people doing that technical role. If I was to go back into, uh, <coughs> uh, into my previous uh, roles in uh, project management firms or, or consulting engineering firms managing uh, projects, I would be rather quite far distant from the role of actually being a civil engineer. But I would have some credibility at carrying out my role. And I would know the process that departments go through at getting things designed. The, uh, the objectives for the course is there is a common framework and terminology of project management. Now, it's not the magic bullet, it, and it's nothing proprietary. There is a framework that has been built on by people since, well, arguably 1983 or 1987 that tries to say, here is a framework of good practice in project management. And <clears throat> it happens to get boiled down to a book, not that we're teaching to a book, I'm trying to instruct here good practice in project management, but this, this is a rather good framework of building it into uh, a framework. It's, it's quite dry, it's not anecdotal, I don't recommend it as a textbook, but I do refer to the framework and to organizations that are doing something to improve their project management, they find this to be a quite a useful, uh, a useful framework. Uh, more about that framework on an upcoming slide. <coughs> um, <coughs> Part of it is understanding even, even the terminology, being able to talk project management with people and be, be, uh, you know, be more understood. Actually, one guy <coughs> took my professional development course. He was a land surveyor. He was an Ontario land surveyor. He owned his own land surveying firm. And he was a kind of a, you know enthusiastic kind of guy in his personal uh, style. <coughs> and uh, he took the course. And then after the course, I happened to be in touch with him. And he said, oh, I love the course, he said. He talk project management language and I was able to impress SNC-Lavalin enough that I picked up this million dollar contract, uh, surveying contract, and then he was showing me pictures of his poor survey crew slogging around in six feet of snow around the edges of James Bay. And I said, great, you know, you learned the language of project management, but did you actually learn anything useful? He said, oh yeah, I picked up a few useful things too. <clears throat> um, I want you all to go away with specific techniques that you can use in your project management toolbox, like critical path method. Uh, for some of you may get your first look at Microsoft Project, for example. I mean, that's a rather small objective, but it is something you'll get exposed to. Uh, the concept of work breakdown structures, the concept of, of teams getting together to do certain things using post-it notes, which is actually a useful thing in project management, not just in classrooms. <coughs> uh, other, other techniques, you'll have some lessons from painful lessons I have learned over the years and in the, in the research you're going to do at looking up an old project, well, a past project, you will learn the lessons and articulate the lessons of that particular project. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you'll either enter into the workplace or return to the workplace able to fit into their project management process. And for some of you, maybe in a position to make some improvements to that organization's project management process. And uh, I did mention there are some designations uh, in, in project management, and this course will advance you toward any of those that you choose. There is one particularly that tends to be particularly popular in, uh, in North America. <clears throat> what would I mean by a project? What is it that distinguishes a project from something that's not a project? Deadline. There's a deadline. There's a... Uh, there's a um, there's a completion for the project that we're probably targeting. Yeah, 
temporary and unique. Temporary meaning it has a beginning and an end, and unique meaning we're doing something different. Anything else that might distinguish a project from something that's not a project? A time? So time or a schedule, uh, cost or a budget for the project? Oh yeah, it's, it's, there's uh, management of people or human resources, management of procurement. Yeah. Now management of procurement, assuming the, the project is purchasing something from outside the project, like goods or services. Yes, we hope it has a fixed end date. I just say that tongue in cheek. Sometimes projects drag on much too long. <laughs> but you're quite right, a beginning and an end. Anything else that a project might have that uh, might not be part of a non-project? Uh, yeah, if we're doing the same project over and over again, literally the same project, it really wouldn't be a project. Really, that would be operations. A project would have objectives, yeah. Now actually, <clears throat> I agree with everything everybody said. Now some of these things though would also apply to operations. Operations would have objectives, strategic objectives. Operations would be managing procurement, buying goods and services from outside. Uh, operations would have schedules, would have budgets, uh, would be managing people. And really, what distinguishes a project for us here are a couple of things that, uh, well, Rebecca captured it actually. Uh, uh, a project is a temporary endeavor. Temporary means it has a start and a finish. Undertaken to produce a unique product, service, or result. It doesn't have to be fabulously unique, but it has to be at least somewhat different from the last one that we did. Because if it was quite similar, we wouldn't call it a project. We'd say it's an ongoing operation. Now this casts the net quite broadly. So a project could, uh, you know, a project uh, could be um, my own plan to rip out the inside of my, to empty my closet and install closet organizers over the weekend. I mean, that may seem trivial. And I'm not going to apply real rigorous documented project management to this. I'm not going to come up with a 200 page project plan. But I am going to do project, I'm going to do some aspects of project management at a very, very light, um, in a very light way, I'm going to be applying the stuff that we're going to be talking about here over the next uh, several days. I'm going to be thinking about my scope, I'm going to think about time and cost, I'm even going to think about some risks. How can I make risks less likely? Uh, I'm going to be thinking about stakeholders, namely my wife, and you know, things like that. Uh, and it's this project management stuff is applicable at the very large end of billions of dollars and tens of years. Although frankly, sometimes if we get that big uh, and, and that long, it may be in fact we call it a program which may consist of projects. We'll get to that. Uh, now, I have a few slides here on fundamental principles of PM, but I think it's a little too early for me to try to uh, put those across right now, a little too early in the course. I'm going to skip through them and go to slide 19. Why do organizations use project management? By the way, <clears throat> I am building up to um, uh, an exercise. We will have several exercises here in this room. This is why I, our, our hours are somewhat longer. Uh, we will have exercises. Uh, I'll put you in teams uh, and um, uh, that makes our hours a little longer. Uh, but it probably means less you have to do at home. And um, I guess I should, I, I should have asked earlier if there's any questions about the format of the course, the requirements, the uh, exams, the, the project. Yeah. Oh, there is an online simulation. I did not use it in the last term, but I had used it in the fall term. Uh, I wanted to get feedback from the fall students and actually liked it quite a bit. Um, we in this course are going to focus a lot more on the mechanics of project management. We will talk about the importance of stakeholders and dealing with people and dealing with teams. Um, but I have another way that focuses on stakeholders and 
some of the softer aspects of project management. It's, a, it's an online simulation from the Netherlands called Shark World. And this is why I was asking you for your email addresses, because I don't have, through the portal, I do not have direct access to your actual email uh, address. All I can do is send you an email through the portal. But I do need your email addresses. I think most of you have responded, and even though I didn't reply back, if you responded to me, you should feel comfortable that I have it. Uh, so if you have not yet responded to me, just send me a message so I can read it in your, you know, in your ID line, uh, from line, or, or tell me your personal Gmail address, whichever you prefer. The University of Toronto email address does work. And I have to uh, sign you up using your email address, and you will receive a message from Shark World. Now, Shark World, <coughs> I'll introduce it a little better with a slide, um, probably tomorrow morning. Um, but um, it's a three-hour simulation. It's, it's quite intense. I don't think anybody wants to do three hours at once. In fact, you can stop at any time. Like you can stop after 20 minutes and then resume it a day or two later if you want. But after one hour, approximately one hour, it will stop you. So you will be stopped and you won't be able to sign in for another 20 minutes. Um, when you do respond to the initial email, if it asks you for a cell phone number, I recommend you do put in your cell phone number. Uh, if I remember right, I think you should put in the plus one for our country code, and you will get text messages from the Shark World organizers. If you don't have a cell phone or you don't enter the number, you won't get those text messages. That's not a deal breaker. That's okay. You will get email addresses from some of the players in Shark World. In Shark World, you will be a project manager working for, hired by a company in the Netherlands. Uh, you will be amused by your boss, who's an interesting character, uh, and uh, you will be sent to build a shark aquarium in Shanghai. Interesting things will happen during the construction of this shark world aquarium. Challenges will happen. You will be delivering a scope. You will have a schedule. You will have a budget. The game is a little unsophisticated, frankly, about um, dealing with the time and cost issues, but try to pay attention to them. It focuses more on your relationships with stakeholders, um, and I won't say any more about, about that. Uh, sorry for the long answer, but it needed to be said. Oh, and I will ask you, as a submission, I'll ask you, I haven't articulated it yet, but probably maybe a two-page submission to me at the end, just saying what happened and what did you learn, and I'll probably ask you to put in your scores, uh, because you will get three scoring boxes at the end of the three modules. It, it, so that's not a big, intense assignment. You've got to go through the time of experiencing it, but writing it up for me is not intended as a big deal. Any other questions? Uh, I will encourage you to gather. Now, here in the classroom, I will break you into teams just geographically around the room. But you can use a different team you know, uh, makeup for your research team. Well, uh, yeah, by research team, I mean that uh, you'll, break, you'll, you'll form teams of three or four. Um, uh, you could, turn, you could assemble three or four from the same discipline, although it doesn't matter. It can be across disciplines. And you will choose a project that has finished in the last 15 years to research. You will look into that project. Hopefully, it's a project where there's lots of information available, um, in, enough information that you're able to have multiple sources. <clears throat> and you will um, look into um, uh, lessons learned. What can be learned from that project? Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the project crashed and burned and is a bad news story. It could be a good news story. It could be a project that went really well. And whether it went well or it did not go well, you can probably pull both good lessons and bad lessons from that. But the intention is not to sort of lay blame and say, this is what went wrong. In all cases, you're looking at a project to say, if we were doing a project like that now, what would we do differently? What have we learned from that project that we can apply to future projects? I think teams enjoy the, the work. Uh, I think that uh, uh, you will come up with, you will put on a presentation um, of 12 to 15 minutes plus questions and answers on the very last day. 
and you will write a report that's due, I forget whatever date I specified, maybe it may be a week or so after the, the, after the final test. Uh, and I think with a number of people working on it, that's not, people don't seem to find it too, too demanding. But I, I do want a nice written report. I want several sources of information. We will run it through Turnitin just to help you avoid you know, the danger sometimes that we may be cut and paste inappropriately, which we didn't really intend to do. Um, <clears throat> the projects could be, um, they could be high, pro, you know, high profile public projects. Many of those are construction projects, but don't feel it has to be construction. You know, uh, airline, uh, uh, airline projects are high profile as well. You know, uh, it's popular to do, to, uh, to do Boeing or Airbus examples. Or the uh, United States has some military vehicles that they, or, or aircraft that they design and produce that, can, that are, are well documented and you can find sources of information for. Now, because of the nature of this course as being best practices uh, rather than intense research into the leading edge of project management, you don't need, your, your sources don't need to be journal, journal articles. Some of them may be journal articles, but it's going to be hard to find referee journal articles for a lot of the kinds of projects that you're going to be researching. So we are looser at sort of the acceptability of types of, of resources. Personal, inter if it's, a, if it's a, a project uh, around town here, personal interviews with people who are involved is just fine too, but correctly, you know, correctly quote and reference them in your reference list. Your company says, uh, asks for confidentiality, that's okay, there are things we can do to maintain confidentiality, you know, in the title, or I can even sign a confidentiality agreement if, if that's appropriate. I've done that a couple of times. Any other questions about the project or anything else? You've come well informed. Either that or you're planning to take off out of here at, lunch, at, uh, at break and not come back. <clears throat> uh, why do we use project management? <clears throat> I just got to uh, cover a couple of things on, the, on, the, uh, on, on the, the screen here before we get into an initial exercise. Uh, why do companies use project management? Or why do, we use, why do we try to improve our project management? Why do we try to use more formal project management? Because, of course, you could do anything. Uh, it has a beginning and an end, and, and it would be project management just by definition. <clears throat> well, organizations try to improve their project management or use the discipline of project management because we want to achieve scope and cost and time. Now, it's simplistic, but um, there is a, the, the old triple constraint, which suggests that in a project, you were trying to deliver some scope, you were trying to deliver it within a schedule, and you were trying to deliver it within a budget. This is very simplistic, but I find that it's useful, and I come back to it even in intense project management situations, and we will as well. And if formal project management or the discipline of project management isn't followed, a project emerges, we find a project manager, we appoint the project manager, and hey, maybe it works out really well. That project manager had the competencies, and maybe other, some other things were in place. It's a fabulous success. The next project may not be so fabulously successful. Organizations want to be consistent at achieving their scope and cost and time. So therefore, organizations tend to want to do something to improve their project management. Uh, <clears throat> well, many of us in organizations will use project management because we do projects for a living and we want to earn a profit. Now, <clears throat> I know it's simplistic to say there's two kinds of companies in the world, just like there's two kinds of people in the world. But for our purpose, some organizations are project driven. They do projects for a living. Construction contractors, consulting engineering firms, management consulting firms, all kinds of suppliers are doing things for their customers and they're doing it for a living. They tend to be better at managing those projects because it shows up on the bottom line right away when the project is underway and finished, did we make money at it? There are also organizations that do projects for internal customers, where the organization is actually not project driven, the organization is an operating organization and they happen to do projects. That, uh, that same discipline that would have been there between the supplier and the, the client may not be there. We as project managers are expected to bend and sway to our customers and internal stakeholders. We're in a more awkward situation. I have some, sim some sympathy with those of you who are or may be internal project managers, 
it is a bit more difficult to apply this stuff. <clears throat> Organizations are responding to market pressures. There was a big growth of interest in project management in the late mid to late 1990s. A couple of things were driving that. One is a lot of operating organizations like financial institutions and telephone companies realized that, hey, a lot of what we do is actually not providing regular telephone services and financial services. A lot of what we do is projects. We're developing new products, new credit card products, uh, uh, new, uh, new, new, uh, well, later, new cell phone products for our customers, uh, and uh, they really jumped on the bandwagon, which spread the interest in project management <clears throat> from its originators, which really was construction and aerospace and defense. Uh, it helps, uh, project management helps us coordinate across disciplines, particularly in the way that we organize for projects. We'll get around to that in the second week. It helps us use people productively again, in the way that we organize people. Helps us avoid surprises. We'll have a significant chapter on project risk management, which will be dealing with negative uncertainties or threats and positive uncertainties or opportunities uh, in a project management way. And Oh, and there's a few pages attached here uh, that I think there is any of these that I might draw your attention to. Um, studies have shown that uh, I guess here I'm really not so much making a pitch to you, a sales pitch to you, but a sales pitch to organizations to suggest to them investing in project management probably will pay off. Um, <clears throat> um, there are, uh, studies have looked at the maturity of organizations in project management. Now the way that, the way that we look at maturity of organizations maturity of project management in organizations is <clears throat> uh, we usually use sort of checklists and we say how much of this project management stuff do you do? It doesn't sound very convincing. It sounds like you're measuring formality, which isn't necessarily mean that you do it well. But the studies show that organizations that seem to do most of that project management stuff that we're going to cover the proportion of their budget, which is project management, is less. In immature organizations that seem to do less of the project management stuff, the percentage of the budget in project management seems to be larger. Now, this seems counterintuitive. If you're doing more project management, why isn't it costing you more? And I think we can uh, say that the reason is because in immature organizations, project management is much less effective because we're putting out fires as opposed to setting ourselves up for, for success with good planning and organization in the first place. It's hard to actually compare the budgets. It's hard to say, are, are they more likely to be over and under budget at the end? There's all kinds of methodological ways where it's hard to do that. It's hard to make measurements showing the return on investment at improving uh, project management because you're talking so much about perceptions of things. <clears throat> but we also know that scheduled performance index is, uh, is better, and cost performance index measures as better in, oh, oh, in mature organizations. We will uh, talk about significantly cost performance index and scheduled performance index when we get to cost management. Uh, just a, a word about the history of project management. <clears throat> uh, of course, we've been doing project management for thousands of years. You know, the Great Wall of China or the Egyptian uh, pyramids or the Colosseum, of, uh, the Roman Colosseum. Of course, these are big projects. And of course, they had project management. I used to say that, oh, but they weren't managed with the sophistication that we bring to project management today. Well, I've changed my tune because we're starting to get some good research on the actual management of these projects of antiquity, and they were a lot more sophisticated than I had thought. Quite different in emphases and approach from one to another and to today. But I can say that modern project management, as we espouse it today, started to emerge between the 30s and the 50s. <clears throat> it was um, modern management theory as far back as the 1910s, I suppose, started to push us in this direction. 
<clears throat> time and motion theory of uh, time and motion studies of Frederick Taylor. And one of Frederick Taylor's contemporaries was Henry Gantt, who is famous for the Gantt the Gantt chart or the bar chart. He did other things that were mathematical and graphical ways for managers to manage work, but the, the Gantt chart, of course, lives on. Uh, product management in Procter & Gamble in the 1930s. Let's say Christopher is the manager of advertising in Procter & Gamble, and I work for Christopher in his advertising department. And Anthony here is the product manager for Crest Toothpaste. Well, Christopher assigns me to Anthony. I work with Anthony on Crest Toothpaste, and if I need any support from my function, I go back to Christopher and, and he provides some assistance or he provides some, some, somebody else. You know, it's, that's the earliest glim glimmers of the matrix organization. It comes in for all kinds of criticism, but we will see that it is commonly applied and there's reasons for it in project management. <clears throat> um, the rise of systems engineering in the United States, particularly U.S. Air Corps, U.S. Army Air Corps, which became the U.S. Air Force and other forces in the Department of Defense in the United States were early users of project management. PERT, Program Evaluation and Review Technique, came from there. Uh, earned Value Method came from there. Um, project Risk Management largely came from there and other areas. Integrated Project Teams came from there. Process Plant Engineering, Exxon, now Exxon Mobil, and DuPont were in the private sector early generators of how can, what can we do to plan our process plant design and construction better. Critical path method came from there. <clears throat> uh, 1950s in particular with the US, uh, the United States forces uh, and the Polaris missile project is a famous one. Well, not that we care so much, but it does happen to be famous for the initiator of PERT and the uh, work breakdown structures. And uh, the critical path method came from DuPont. <clears throat> And uh, all kinds of professional, several professional associations were formed in 1969, um, one of which is PMI, and I, I, I will make mention to any of you who happen to be interested about the PMP or Project Management Professional Designation. Many students here do have some interest in that, and I can, I can fill you in about that. But we'll, let's come back to that later if, if there's interest. Now, <clears throat> what is this body of knowledge that we're going to be talking about? <clears throat> The larger bubble here is the project management body of knowledge. This is everything that people can or do use to manage their projects. Not necessarily best or, or, or good practice, just what do people do? <clears throat> now, um, there are teams of people who every four years have been emerging with a printed guide, which is not to be all and end all, but it's a pretty good framework. That's the book that I was waving in the air here. and. Um, <clears throat> Um, a new one just emerged in January, by the way, and <clears throat> it has knowledge areas. We're going to largely use those knowledge areas as our uh, framework for the course. There, there's scope management, time management, and cost management means defining what scope we're going to deliver at the end of the project and defining what the schedule is going to be and promise date and milestone dates. And cost is what, what does the budget have to be? And hopefully those there are a, a realistic balance of scope and cost and time. And <clears throat> then that knowledge area says, now let's control against that scope and cost and time for the rest of the project. <clears throat> then there's quality management. How can we make sure we really do address the requirement for which the project is undertaken? We do not have a chapter in this course on quality management. Not that it's not important, uh, but we can't fit everything in. <clears throat> Procurement management is the processes we go through to buy goods and services outside of our organization. Risk management is thinking about uncertainties in the future that could affect us. Should we do something about that? <clears throat> Communications management is figuring out who needs what information, how are we going to communicate with them? Status report, meetings, informal, um, and stakeholders has emerged as a separate um, um, knowledge area. Hugely important to recognize who has a stake in our project? Let's not ignore them. Let me not focus on the technology of the project. As a project manager, I've got to focus on who the stakeholders are, who the client is. The, um, how does this fit into our business environment? And human resources management, dealing with people and teams. Integration management up there, by the way, means pulling it all together into a coherent whole. <clears throat> now, there are 
as you'll see in an attached page, page 19, <clears throat> there are 47 processes of project management. Two of them have, oh, oh um, yeah, 47 processes of project management, and they fit into process groups across the top. Here are three of the process groups, <clears throat> planning, executing, and controlling. In fact, um, I remember the very first management course I took, they, they said uh, management could be thought of as managing the process of planning what you're going to do, doing it, and then monitoring how it's going. I mean, that's simplistic. Uh, but definitely in project management, there are some things we do to start the project, and there are some things we do to close or finish off the project. So this particular footnote, um, there's nothing magical about the framework. You could say, who cares about the framework? Who cares about this artificial framework? It's just an artificial construct. I agree completely. The important thing in project management is what we do. But if you're going to have a course in project management, maybe it makes sense to have that content somehow organized, and this is the organization we're going to use. Two of the processes have to do with <clears throat> initiating. Two of them have to do with closing the project. Quite a few have to do with planning. And a few have to do with executing. Quite a few have to do with, uh, with controlling. Uh, now, <clears throat> um, let me go back one slide. When I'm managing project then, I'm I'm applying this project management stuff, but I'm also applying interpersonal skills, getting along with people, communicating, motivating, getting people to share my vision. <clears throat> Any general management knowledge and skills that I have, of course I can use it. Depending on uh, wh what my project is, there may be other knowledge and standards and regulations that I need. If I'm doing this in the public sector, there's some different implications than I'm doing it in the private sector. If it's a construction project, uh, I'm going to put a lot of focus on construction safety, but there's no mention of safety other than this word anywhere else in this course. It's not because it's not important, but it's specific to your application, which may be on the factory floor or on a construction site. It's not relevant to this smaller blue circle. And understanding the project environment. How do we do, how do, we do business? If we're an organization with a client doing a project for them, uh, how do we do business with that client? How do we get the business? How do we make a profit? Uh, or even within our organizations, how, does, how do things work within our organizations? Uh, is my project a part of a program and a part of a portfolio? And there's also the product-oriented processes. So <clears throat> if we're, uh, uh, if we're uh, developing a software program, and let's even say we're using an agile approach, um, I say that because some people think Agile is the opposite of this project management approach, but really not at all. It's one specific, it can be a specific product-oriented nature of how we're actually doing the, uh, the execution. Or <clears throat> if we're designing and building a manufacturing plant, uh, or uh, uh, we're uh, putting on an event, let's say it's a musical theater, um, the knowledge of how do you put together a musical theater or how do you design and build your manufacturing plant and actually doing it is actually in here. The stuff we're going to talk about is at a higher level. So we can all talk about these things even though we may be talking about quite different kinds of you know, projects uh, of our own. Now, there's a particular thing that I want to do before... Uh, oh, yeah. In the past, I've used... A, uh, uh, oh, here it is. <clears throat> um, in the past, I've used an exercise here, <clears throat> and you can see uh, this is actually in, uh, I think it's in Darlington, England, Darlington in North Yorkshire, not Darlington in Ontario. <clears throat> and uh, we had a tower building exercise. Look at this uh, majestic tower. Look at that. It's, um, it goes almost up to the rather high ceiling in that floor. Here in this classroom, I sometimes use that exercise. I have a different one to use. And this will give me the opportunity to uh, um, break you into teams 
And I'm also going to ask for one volunteer. Uh, do we have a volunteer from one of the middle tables here? Maybe we have two volunteers. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> There's a reason why they're volunteering, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to, um, I'm going to let you read. Oh, geez. This is, um, my colleague that came up with the slide likes his, he animates his um, slides rather differently than I do. I don't want them to fade. Effect options. Don't dim. Yeah. I have, uh, I have fabulous merchandise to offer as, um, as prizes. And I'm going to, um, well, let's see what we're going to do in terms of groups first. Uh, and um, may I have the two volunteers, please? <coughs> They will be assisting me at this. Now I need you to. Now I have to. <coughs> uh, I find here at the University of Toronto, the caretaking staff really is quite helpful. In fact, it was them that got me into this locked room this morning. I don't like to make life difficult with them. We'll be dealing with large quantities of spaghetti. Um, they may end up on the floor. Let's try to keep them on our table. I'm going to ask each team to uh, clear one table on which you can carry out your project. I'm going to ask these two to, as, good, as well as you can, just visually, I don't want you to count them. I need six different piles of spaghetti. Obviously, half a box, half a box, half a box. <coughs> now, <coughs> I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to give you five minutes of planning when you're not going to be allowed to uh, touch the material. The material you're going to get is half a box of spaghetti. <clears throat> it is, it's whole wheat spaghetti. Now the caution here is whole wheat spaghetti has, it doesn't have as good a bending strength, like it breaks more readily than white spaghetti, so be cautious. And each, so each team gets a half, half a box of spaghetti. Each team, now there's an important learning objective to this. This is not just for fun. There is an important learning objective. If you know what that objective is already from past communications or having done this exercise, please don't reveal it to your team. Um, I will give, every, every team will get that much masking tape. And uh, your task is to build a bridge. <clears throat> you'll have, as I say, you'll have five minutes to plan it. <clears throat> you'll have ten minutes to actually build the bridge. It must be self-standing. And um, I have a metric tape measure provided by my UK training partner. I will also provide Oh, good. We also have, every team will get two plastic cups as abutments. No, oh, you're going to need four. Oh, my gosh. What do I do now? You have to use, some teams will get, <laughs> oh, what can we do? You're going to have to come up with your own abutments. Oh! <clears throat> Coffee cups. Yeah, yeah but uh, these don't. Uh, hmm? Oh, oh, good idea. Three teams can use boxes, and uh, two teams can use these coffee cups. Two teams have to scrounge up your own coffee cups, so drink quickly. Um, the car goes this way. The question was, what if I were to grab my little thing right there? Double the product. <laughs> See, we actually don't need that. Yeah, <laughs> 
Structure, we're just like we're just having it. We yeah, just, just flat. flat. Yeah. And after that, we can just tape all of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We could do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, we like it would support. Can we do this way? Yeah, let's do this way again. So, so, so we should put it. But what happened is this the, in the middle is going to. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're not gonna get more of the rich of all of them. It just, it just one spaghetti time, yeah, whatever. Yeah, time so, yeah. 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 Well, that worked out. And the other criteria is the min uh, to have ramps on both sides. No teams had ramps. And the last criteria, which is the one that we kicked in, which is the minimum amount of materials. Now, I tell you this because <clears throat> this may seem like a trivial little exercise. For example, uh, in, um, in my own background of uh, pulp and paper and industrial engineering construction projects, <clears throat> Maybe your customer wants this production facility to run for 10 years. They don't need you to design it and materials in it to last 40 years. That would be spending too much money. They have a 10-year lifespan. And there's other things that could apply to what is, the what is the customer actually looking for. Do they want it to look good? Or are they looking for serviceability? Are there some things about the bridge that I didn't happen to volunteer, but customers won't volunteer, and you have to ask uh, about things like, well, what about ramps, or what about this, or what about this? You have to ask all kinds of about what may seem like dumb questions to your, to your customers and to other stakeholders around that bridge to find out what requirements are. Uh, <clears throat> part of that is <clears throat> the balance among scope and cost and time. Simplistic as it is, it is actually rather important that <clears throat> In this case, uh, having a grander scope, if you were able to achieve like a double lane bridge or a longer bridge, that wouldn't actually be a further appeal to me. Uh, taking, doing it quicker would not be appealing to me. Keeping the cost down is very appealing to me. So, you know, the balance of the constraints for me as the customer is that cost is hugely com uh, important scope just has to meet those certain, you know, barely meet those requirements. And time is kind of, a, well, uh, time, it's important that you don't exceed the time. Uh, but these are, expect yourselves to be asking those kinds of questions to your customers and to other people around. Let's take a break. Ten minute break, my buzzer will go off in ten minutes and we'll get started. Choice question, so you, you can, you know, Maybe expect to look for that. Definition of a program, I'll leave it with you because it's in your course notes. <clears throat> and, uh, oh yeah, I was going to ask this gentleman if, in fact, you did find, yeah. th yes, there are textbooks in the bookstore. There's about eight more. There's eight more there. <clears throat> and it probably was around $20? $20, 20 dollars yeah. <clears throat> Um, I said we were never going to mention portfolio again. I forgot about this slide. <clears throat> we hope, now this is for in internal projects, remember. We hope that our organization has vision and mission. And that that vision and mission has led to the organization coming up with strategic objectives. Hopefully measurable objectives. Now, <clears throat> I am not any kind of expert on corporate governance and strategy, so I'm not going to address this any further. But as project managers, let's assume that those are there. <clears throat> and in portfolio management, 
your project has been selected because it somehow addresses the uh, objectives of the organization. The objective is to maintain a certain line of business or grow a certain line of business or increase your facilities or move into different markets or whatever, whatever that objective is. <clears throat> um, or maintain or grow profit or revenue, whatever it is. Or if it's a public sector organization, the objectives are rather different rather than being profit and revenue, necessarily profit and revenue oriented. But still there are objectives. Portfolio selects your project so that it's aligned with an objective and um, we are managing the project to deliver something. We deliver that something. If it's an internal project, we deliver it to operations. The operations people are managing the operations of the organization and somehow producing value. They're producing revenue, they're producing uh, uh, profit, or they're producing the benefits to our public sector clients, whatever it is. And typically, in projects, we are typically producing something that they will use in producing value. <clears throat> Please uh, interrupt at any time with, uh, you know, a question or objection or clarification or uh, anything. <clears throat> uh, I think we went through this slide, and I mentioned a little bit about history. Uh, and uh, we mentioned the structure that we're going to be following. Uh, oh yeah, there's two parts to the structure. That, uh, this page I showed you, <clears throat> and I did say this is strictly an arbitrary structure. It's the, it's the things that we do in project management, and are we consistently able to deliver a project that's perceived as a success? I say perceived because it can be hard to be consistent with deciding how do you measure project success. Um, <clears throat> there are, um, oh, that's not the page. There was a page that showed, uh, yeah, page 19 shows the uh, 47 processes, uh, which consists of, uh, I think, nine or, no, 10 knowledge areas and five process groups, um, arbitrary, but still it's the structure we're going to use um, and each process is part of a process group and is part of a knowledge area, and we will be talking about many, but not all, of those um, process, processes. <clears throat> Another word in terms of the structure is that each process has inputs I will not question you in any exam on the artificial structure. So don't worry too much about this structure. Uh, but if some of you are interested in the PMP or other designations, then being familiar and comfortable with the structure will be relevant. Uh, but there will be some significant inputs to a process. There will be some tools and techniques of a process. And there will be some outputs of a process of those uh, 47 processes. <coughs> One of my partners says that she doesn't use this anymore um, because it's been, uh, it's a little out of date and it's been replaced in Project Management Institute's thinking with six constraints <clears throat> as opposed to just these three constraints. Well, I make reference to the six constraints, but really I find boiling down to these three, although it's simplistic, is useful. If I'm... <coughs> Uh, and it's useful three or four different times. When we're planning, when we're defining and planning a project, <clears throat> customer has a certain scope in mind. In fact, maybe they have a certain scope and a deadline date and a budget in mind, and they come to me. I should not just be taking that and saying, thank you very much, I'll see you in six months. <clears throat> I should be doing something to try to verify that it can be done. Uh, you know, unless there's already clearly some planning that led up to that being realistic. I want to make sure that's realistic. Can I deliver that scope in that time and that cost? Maybe it'll be a bit of, if it's an internal project, maybe there's a bit of iterative negotiation here. Maybe I say, well, I'll go away and, and see what could be achievable. Uh, maybe I come back and say, well, if you'd like all of that scope, actually, I think it's going to cost you twice as much and 50% more time. 
What can we do about that? Well, yes, we can add to the cost, we can add to the time. Maybe we can strategize other strategic ways to get it done that would reduce the cost or the time. Maybe we're going to reduce the scope. But hopefully, when a project gets approved, or actually there can be several gates at which a project gets reapproved, hopefully it is a balance here that's going to be achievable. And <clears throat> during the project, I'm going to be managing the scope and the cost and the time. The scope, uh, the scope may change or there may be requests to change the scope. If there is a request to change the scope and make it bigger, then I should be identifying that there's additional cost and additional time required and get that approved. If whoever is asking for the scope change doesn't want to pay the extra cost or give the extra time, then they don't have to approve the scope change. Now sometimes we might discover scope. We just realize it is simply going to be more work than we had thought and there's nobody to ask for more time or money well, at least then, as a project manager, I am responsibly forecasting the variance on cost and time that I expect to flow from this. <clears throat> this reminds me to, uh, uh, I'm going to draw it on the board so I don't forget. There's a, <clears throat> there's a, a real project story that I like to summarize <clears throat> here. Uh, so, I'm controlling against these three, uh, and um, at the end of the project, hopefully, I deliver the scope that was promised. Hopefully, I'm doing it within the schedule, and hopefully, I'm doing it within the budget. And even though I said success can be hard to measure or maybe measured by different things, we often would take this as a sort of generic measure of success to deliver against these three. Now, I did say this was simplistic. Do you see any particular problems with this? I mean, uh, is there some improvement or something that's missing uh, that you might identify? Well, <coughs> yeah, and in fact, I wonder if it shows up on the next slide. Uh, oh, oh, I pressed in the wrong direction. Uh, oh, well, yeah, actually, um, I don't have it on the next slide, but... Uh, <coughs> Project Management Institute uh, says that there's six constraints. There's scope that I'm supposed to deliver. There's the cost or budget within which I am to deliver it. There is the time or the schedule within which I'm delivering it. There, is, there may be a number of resources that I have available, which could be facilities or other things, or more commonly we think of it as people. If I've only got five people available, then that would be a constraint. And they say that risk is a, re is a, is a constraint. And I think they, sh they say that quality is a constraint. Um, and I agree with scope because I have to deliver something. I'm delivering it within a budget. I'm delivering it within a schedule. I may only have a certain number of people resources to deliver it with. Quality, yes. I, am, I should be constrained to deliver against the requirements, which really is quality. I don't particularly like risk as a constraint because risks are there. I should be trying to minimize them. I should be trying to minimize the probability and the impact. Um, but <coughs> since I've already drawn these six now, um, we've already identified that quality is not there. How would, you, how would you address quality? Or have you seen other models of this little triple constraint? It's called the triple constraint or the iron triangle often. Uh, have, you, have you seen this where quality may have been addressed? Yeah. Some people would put quality here instead of scope because the scope itself is kind of who cares about the scope as long as we actually deliver you something that performs the way you wanted it to uh, is actually more important than what the thing is. Uh, some people, so some people would put quality there. Some people make this a, a square. Well, okay, I know it's not a square. With another corner here for quality. The way that I address it is I actually don't use scope. I use performance. So our project might be to replace the press section. Replace the press section is right here. 
with a certain model of press section that's already been chosen by our customer. And clearly, we're trying to do that within a, a, a schedule and a, and a cost. <clears throat> now, at the end of the project, just the fact that a press section has been installed really isn't nearly as important as how it's performing. That the reason that we're replacing the press section presumably was to make the paper machine faster, increase the water squeezing out in the press section, uh, improving the reliability of the press section. You know, it's reasons like this that we're actually carrying out the project. So it's achieving those criteria with that press section that's actually much more important. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> oh yeah, here's, oh yeah. Let's go off to my story, <clears throat> which uh, this story illustrates a number of the tools or discussions that we're going to have. <clears throat> this was a, it's a, an organiza it's a client organization that will remain unnamed. <clears throat> I will, if I'm telling a good news story, I will often, uh, you know, from my corporate engagements, I will often name the company to give them credit. If it's a story that is not such a good story, I will never name the client name. <clears throat> the project team was here in Toronto. This is an organization that's very quality oriented. Do things properly. Very much so. <clears throat> and. Uh, their head office is, was here, and their head, their, the head, their, their engineering office was here. <clears throat> and they had an internal project to build a physical facility in far northern Ontario, rather remote in northern Ontario. <clears throat> and they had two internal operating organizations that were their customers. They were engineering and building this thing, this physical facility that would be operated by internal customers. And <clears throat> the requirement came up, and they talked to those customers about what they needed, and uh, they came up with a, uh, uh, with a scope and a, and a cost and a time. We would call it the project management plan. Uh, in many organizations like that, you might call it a, a capital appropriation request or request for expenditure. Um, <clears throat> and they got it approved. The project was approved. There was a rather short amount of planning that went on. <clears throat> but they came up with their document, and it was approved. And the first thing they did, first thing they did after the project was approved, was they all got on an airplane and rented a car or whatever it took or flew in. They went to the site. What did they say when they arrived at the physical location where they were going to be building this facility? Words to that effect, oh no, or whoops, we didn't know it looked like that. We didn't know the topography and so on looked like that. Well, they already had a plan. Uh, they already had you know, early very early engineering, and they had a cost and schedule. But now they know it's not going to work. So, <clears throat> however, they're a quality organization. We're going to give our operating departments what they're looking for. I will often draw an S-curve partly because the S-curves are quite relevant to the method of cost and schedule control we're going to be looking at called earned value, but also because um, it's simply conceptually interesting way to talk about, useful way to talk about a project that over time we're planning to spend some money. Over plan, over time, we're planning to spend the budget. In fact, we're going to be calling it budget at completion, but really it means approved budget and we're promising to finish it by a certain date. <clears throat> so they plunge into the design. And uh, their actual spending is like this, uh, as opposed to this is their planned spending. <clears throat> we'll cover the acronyms later. <clears throat> and the next thing that affects them is that their two operating customers seem to have a lot more requirements than they had had at the beginning. There were some requirements that had not been exposed during project planning that now are coming to light. So they're adding to the scope. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Oh, yeah, we better cover that. Oh, we didn't think about that. Oh, we're going to add it. The scope is growing. 
They continue to barrel away. Their, their scheduled performance is quite good, by the way. Um, but it's costing more. And they continue to spend money more than had been planned until they reach 80% of the budget. When they've spent 80% of the budget, they're mandated by corporate regulations to go back to the board of directors and ask for more money. It was board of directors because it was an expensive enough project to require high approval. <clears throat> so they had to go back and ask for more money. They asked for more money and they spent that money. When they spent that money, they had to go back to the board of directors again and ask for more money and it eventually completed way over budget and pretty good on the schedule. There was a bit of a schedule delay. <clears throat> um, what are some things here threaded through my story that are things that uh, should have gone a little better or should have gone differently? What's wrong with my story? <clears throat> they, in retrospect, given that they had never gone to the physical site, and that whole bunch of requirements seemed to be emerging later, they should have spent more effort at planning. I say more effort, but that probably would have meant more time. Now, uh, project management doesn't say that we must spend huge amounts of time and effort on planning, but it does say that if you, if you want execution to go a lot more smoothly, you will spend more time and effort on planning than you might otherwise. You know, there can be reasons why we might do it really short. You know, we're responding to an emergency, for example. Something else in my story that doesn't ring uh, correctly or could be better. Yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, don't wait until some point comes where you're mandated to go back and admit it. Fess up early. <clears throat> uh, they knew there was a problem when they went to the site. They knew there was a problem, well, a problem in terms of cost anyway, in terms of scope growth. Report it. Uh, I believe that on a project where we are in fact doing cost management um, and a project that, is, that spans multiple reporting periods, so this wouldn't be true of like a weekend project or a one week project, but for a project that's like a year, um, we're probably reporting every month. And when we report, we should be reporting on how are things going right now. And by the way, I'm not advocating a huge detailed project report. They can be very brief. But I should be flagging to people how much longer is it going to take and how much more is it going to cost that as they knew that the cost was increasing, it should somehow have been reported that we're forecasting more money. You can forecast your estimate at complete. It doesn't have to be approved. Your, the budget is what's approved. The forecast of your estimate at complete is what you forecast to happen. Because as a responsible project manager, if you're going to go over budget and over schedule, you should be looking for evidence of that earlier and reporting it. Maybe management will work with you on solving the problem or simply accepting that, yeah, you're doing good work. Yes, we want that extra scope. Yes, you can have more dollars. What else? Kind of related to that. Well, I guess it's almost the same as what I just said. <clears throat> um, you know, at, rep at regular reporting periods, um, Your um, reporting, monitoring and reporting, involves forecasting. But also, <clears throat> when the specific things happen that are going to cause growth in scope, put it through a scope change process. Oh, <clears throat> so you, the operating uh, line of the operating uh, department, want something else in our project. OK. Um, let me go away and investigate what the impact will be in terms of cost and schedule and other things. Write it up and somebody can consciously approve that yes, we do want that extra scope and yes, we, are, uh, we realize it's going to cost money more and take more time, if that's the case. So now it's a conscious decision 
and your baseline has been changed. Here, a pro the, the project manager and the project team at the end of the project had to live with the fact that they were 50% over budget and 10% behind schedule. It looked bad for them. If they had identified these reasons for, for scope growth at the time that they happened, well, frankly, there's not much excuse for not visiting the site. But if the customers really were coming up with new things and those got approved and added to the scope, and if their budget got increased, it means that when they finish, they'd be on budget and on schedule. They would have looked much better, and it's the right thing to do for the organization. So <clears throat> we're going to put some emphasis on uh, forecasting and scope control and so on. Yes? Well, it would be, frankly, it would be embarrassing. Um, the, another word about this organization is that it used, to be very it used to be sophisticated about project management. They used to do big projects, sophisticated projects, highly technical projects, and they were good at project management, as I understand it. Uh, then they went through some turmoil, and they lost senior staff through you know, outsourcing packages, and now they were less mature than they had to be. Um, it would have been embarrassing to go to the board of directors, but I would say the project manager, yes, ought to, just as a matter of principle, ought to document the fact that things are different than we had thought and uh, uh, indicate what the impact is going to be. Now, it might just be a casual, it may be a more informal con conversation with my boss at first as to how we're going to handle it politically within the organization, but really, rather than let it wait until here or here, where the, the, the organization is stuck with it, <clears throat> really the, 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 uh, the, the, the right thing to do is to identify it when it becomes apparent. Now, <clears throat> some of us are going to be in organizations where we're doing the work on lump sum to an external customer. Other ones are going to be doing it entirely as an internal project where it costs the company whatever it costs. You know, the details may be different. The person to whom we report this may be different. Um, <clears throat> if this is a, a lump sum uh, project for an outside customer, then you know, uh, um, the fact that the site is different, who takes responsibility for that? Maybe we inherently, by making our proposal, maybe we're, we as a company are inherently liable to that, in which case I should be making a big deal internally to my management so we know about it. Or if it's stuff that's not apparent to us and would be reasonable for us an extra from our client, then of course we address it to the client. Uh, details will vary, but as a project manager, crossing my fingers and hoping I get transferred before the project finishes is, I'd say, let's not do that. Any other comment or? Uh, now, <clears throat> Uh, we, <clears throat> I kind of wave my arm here at um, um, the project life cycle, <clears throat> and uh, it's an important principle of project management, uh, the fact that we break our pro we usually break our project into phases. Now, <clears throat> we don't care what you call the phases. Uh, we don't care how many phases you have whether it's two or 22. Um, and another thing, it's up to the organization to decide, or perhaps you to decide as a project manager, or the organization to decide as part of their method, how are they going to carry out the project? In fact, let me go off on the tangent about method or methodology. <clears throat> what we're going to be studying here is the processes of project management. And I'm lucky to have, uh, you know, a, 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 a framework that happens to describe those processes. I don't agree with all of the content in here. Uh, some of the stuff you're going to use, some of the stuff you're not going to use. There's things that are not in here that probably should be in here. But still, it's a useful framework we're going to use. And both this document and me are saying to you, we're discussing processes and tools and some underlying principles. But we're not telling you exactly how your organization must manage its project. It's up for your organization to decide. We handle small capital projects like this. We handle upgrade projects like this. We handle large software projects like this. 
having a consistent process tends to be good as a generality. But it's up to your organization to decide just what exactly that process is. How do you, how do you take those processes in here and actually how are you going to do them? How are you going to document your project management plan? What are you going to include? How do you do risk management? You know, exactly how you do it is up to your organization, and that would be known as your methodology. Now, frankly, methodology is not a perfect word, because methodology really means the study of methods. So really, a better word here is your organization to decide your project management method. But in North America, we almost always say methodology, so I'll probably continue with that. Uh, <clears throat> We help organizations design their project management method. There's also, by the way, a published method in the UK that's becoming more popular in Canada, particularly in public sector projects. And that's called PRINCE2, all caps, P-R-I-N-C-E-2. It's sort of a higher level mandated method with phases and project boards and documents between phases. We're not going to study it here, but it, I, I just mentioned it to you in case you encounter it. Uh, it is a very good method. It does not disagree anything with what we're doing here because we're talking more generally about all of the processes and we dive down deeper into the tools than that method does. So your method may not, <coughs> you know, the words may not be the same as here, the number of phases may not be the same, but this is considered to be sort of a generic life cycle. <coughs> um, I usually say that your life cycle is going to look different according to what you choose it to be for your method and what is actually the product of your, pro of your project. What's the process you go through to uh, design and specify and build, whether it's a software program or a manufacturing plant? You know, or uh, how do you go about uh, developing a new product? It's going to have a huge influence on this. So I say your project life cycle is going to look different according to your product. Other people put it a little differently. Other people will say, well, regardless of what your project is, you're doing this. It's just that the phases within execution may be different. Those are probably both OK, okay uh, views. Now, <clears throat> there's some language up here that we're going to use consistently through this course. It's Project Management Institute language. And um, <clears throat> uh, you may call it other things, but I'm going to define what I mean by it now. <clears throat> so, as an organization, we have found out that somebody wants a project. Maybe we're an internal uh, department to a larger organization, and some line of business wants a product from it, wants something from us. <clears throat> Whatever they give us as a kicking off document, we're going to call it a project statement of work. They probably don't call it that because they're not project managers. They're going to call it a need statement, or, going to, or maybe it's a feasibility uh, study, a result of a feasibility study, or it's, uh, it's a work order request. We really don't care what they call it. We're going to call it a project statement of work, and it may kick off some initiating work among us. Oh, one thing that this might prominently be is, <clears throat> it might be that um, it's a request for proposal from an external customer or a request for quotation will distinguish between the two in procurement management. It's something from an external customer. <clears throat> and we have to do a bit of initiating work internally in order to come up with a project charter. A project charter is a document that formally acknowledges a project and appoints Mohammed here as the project manager and implicitly gives Mohammed the authority to spend money and use people, use staff hours. <clears throat> Um, during this initiation phase, we're probably paying attention to what is it that's being requested. We're probably gathering early requirements, and we're conceptualizing what are we going to deliver, or what problem are we going to solve. Maybe we're coming up with some um, milestone schedule dates, or at least a, a conceptual schedule, and a conceptual budget. Uh, but the important thing is the project charter authorized us to start on that. <clears throat> we'll put our thoughts together and we'll make a bid, no bid decision. If it's a competitive request for proposal, uh, what are the relative scores for, uh, uh, rec for the rated requirements? Do we meet the mandatory requirements? What are the scores on the rated requirements? How would we do? How important is price? How competitive can we be with our competitors? You know, very business thinking. And... <clears throat> 
uh, within, a, within a few minutes or possibly a day, we'll make a bid, no bid decision. We will decide to bid. We will decide to write a proposal. Essentially, that's our charter. We're recognizing a formal proposal and we're appointing our, proposal ma our, our sales manager to lead the effort and spend resources to develop a proposal. That's one example of this. <clears throat> uh, but uh, maybe, you know, maybe instead this is an internal uh, project and you are, uh, for the benefit of your internal customer, maybe coming up with conceptual scope and cost and time. Anyway, we're agreeing that, yeah, we're going to proceed further. Usually a project charter only authorizes you to proceed into planning. It could authorize the whole thing, but let's say it only authorizes you to proceed into further planning. So you do further planning. You're engaging, if it's an engineering project, you're engaging your engineers uh, in it, uh, and uh, we're, we're working up some basic engineering, uh, and um, <clears throat> you know, uh, maybe it's a process a flow sheet, or uh, maybe a process and implementation diagrams uh, to, de to define what it is we're going to deliver. And by the way, to develop a scope enough that uh, we can come up with a schedule and we can come up with a budget and we're willing for those three things to be our baseline. We're willing for that resulting scope statement and schedule and budget. The schedule could just be milestone dates, but still, yes, we can do this for you for $50 million and it'll take us this long and, and um, our project management plan has more planning information in it, in it. What's our organizational chart? What's going to be our procurement strategy? What do we see as some early risks? These sorts of things. If this is a $500 million project, this is going to be a very significant document. If this is uh, um, a $1 million project, this may be a much lighter document. If this is a $50,000 project, it may all be on two sheets of paper. Don't think I'm trying to overdo the documentation. It's the fact that we're thinking about all those things that I just said is part of this project planning. I'll have another example coming up, I think shortly, where maybe there's not just one planning phase, maybe there's, maybe there's three planning phases. <clears throat> um, now, so we reach the end of planning, we produce a project plan with a scope statement. This is probably a gate. It doesn't have to be a gate, but it gives the organization more control if there is a gate. We, in other words, this plan is consciously approved and we do not go into execution until it is approved. Or if we do go into execution, there's, you know, we admit that we could be wasting our time if it isn't approved. Let's say it's a gate, it's formally approved, or it's bounced back for more work or the project is canceled at this point. If it's approved, then we go into execution. The details in execution, the phases, as I was saying, may depend more on your, uh, your product approach. You know, these may be two to four week iterations of, uh, of agile development, or it could be, maybe you're in the public sector and you're building some facility. You're gonna have a very clear design phase, which has to be approved before you go into construction. And procurement has to be somewhere in there too. Uh, if it's construction and it's the industrial world, uh, you may in fact blur your design and construction. They may overlap. Uh, but that's all part of your project management and uh, you know, strategy. Uh, <clears throat> during the project, in the procurement management chapter, we'll talk about procurement statements of work. That's a clumsy phrase. Most of us continue to call them contract statements of work. If on our project we're going to go to the marketplace and buy some package of goods and services, the <clears throat> procurement statement of work simply describes what that is. And during the project, we may be buying hundreds or thousands of packages of work and services, or maybe we're not buying any. Maybe on our project, we're going to one major supplier who's doing virtually all the project. Well, maybe, in fact, we award, you know, we award a con maybe the procurement statement of work is right up here. I'm going to be assuming that during execution there's a number of packages of work and some work we're doing ourselves. <clears throat> Toward the end of the project, project management reminds us that there's some uh, closing things to do. Um, <clears throat> We are handing over something to a customer. 
we are here in this class, we're going to be a little late on that because the nature of handing something over to the customer is going to vary. But we are going to be very big on the concept of doing a post-project review and capturing lessons learned. In fact, the, the assignment that you do of choosing a, you know, a real project that's finished in the last 15 years, uh, you will be looking for lessons learned. Uh, you know, what, what, what can we do differently having learned from this project? And project management makes a big deal about that. <clears throat> the idea of front-end loading came from DuPont, DuPont Chemical. I was saying in the 1950s, DuPont was leading the rest of the private sector world. Well, I guess Exxon was there too. Um, <clears throat> they were leading the rest of us in their development of project management processes. And for decades after this, industrial companies would go to DuPont to benchmark. Show us how you do your project management. Until I think eventually DuPont got sick and tired of people knocking on their doors, and then I didn't hear about it anymore after that. <clears throat> but, um, and uh, um, when I encounter the mining industry, for example, this is very popular in the mining industry. Successive development of the project plan really is what it is. So one of my corporate clients, <clears throat> oh, it's called front-end loading, and these gates are often called one, two, and three. Uh, <clears throat> you don't need to know for the purpose of this course, but just the idea of, of another variety of um, <clears throat> project life cycle. They call the first one a scoping study. It's going to be pretty light in terms of what are we thinking about doing in terms of this mine, new mine development or some improvement to the existing mine or head frame or ore processing or whatever it is. And it's going to be a little light on cost and schedule. And management is going to make a conscious decision, high management is going to make a conscious decision, yes, so far it's approved. <clears throat> then they do, there'll be more work done, which will lead to a, a front-end loading two study, or they happen to call it a pre-feasibility report. It goes further in terms of scope and cost and time. And let's hope it gets approved. <clears throat> and goes into another phase that further develops the scope and the cost and the time, until by the time we get here, we've actually got a very tightly defined project. The cost and schedule are going to be pretty accurate and pretty achievable, and it gets approved again. Now, <clears throat> on the one hand, this may seem like we're wasting our time with analysis and planning. But frankly, in each phase, the engineering is proceeding further. We are making progress in these phases. It's just that rather than approve a $500 million project based on a little bit of information, we're forcing ourselves to stop every few months and show what we've produced, follow a certain process here, show what we produced, uh, what is it we've got now, what's it going to cost, and when is it going to be completed, and that it leads itself to you know, a conscious decision to proceed. I have a, a horror story. Um, it's not a client of mine, uh, but I'm not going to mention the name just in case some of my details aren't quite right. But conceptually, I have the story right. I'm convinced. <clears throat> there, was, uh, there was a prominent Canadian mining company that's now part of an international mining company. I don't know if this project actually had something to do with that or not. Um, <clears throat> but um, they decided to spend, they decided to develop uh, a magnesium processing facility. I'm looking for glimmers of recognition in case anybody happens to know. If you do, let me know either now or at the end of the, you know, at, at lunch whether there are further details that I might be able to use. <coughs> they, uh, they decided to build a magnesium facility because um, there was a demand for magnesium and prices looked pretty good. And they said, hey, you know, there's a lot of magnesium apparently. I don't know this, but some mining engineers or chemical engineers here might know this. There's a good supply of magnesium in, a, in asbestos tailings. In Canada, where are there lots of asbestos tailings? Well, I don't know where they all are, of course, but I do know the eastern townships of Quebec is famous for asbestos mines. Now, asbestos mining, of course, is hugely controversial. Um, I would like to think that in their process for extracting magnesium from asbestos tailings, that I'd like to think that that is, you know, that it was an environmentally conscious process. Let's assume all of that. <clears throat> and uh, they spent $500 million building a magnesium processing facility 
using a very capital intensive approach to uh, produce magnesium. <clears throat> and it took several years. Well, I'm not sure how long I'm not sure how long it took. Maybe it maybe it was only two or three years. And they would have had a project life cycle that would have had some sort of project approval here. They did not, as I understand it, have um, gates, uh, further front-end loading gates. <clears throat> they approved the $500,000 project. They dived into it. I guess it was pretty successful, pretty much on time. And you know, they delivered the aluminum, uh, the magnesium processing plant, and it started to produce ingots. And I think the project cost and schedule were good. I think that it performed properly. And um, <clears throat> but over these over these couple of years. <clears throat> from the time that they identified, that the company identified the market need, the world magnesium supply situation had changed. There were some notably Chinese providers of magnesium who had a process for producing magnesium that was quite different, was labor intensive instead of being capital intensive, and simply was cheaper. So when they came on the market with their magnesium I'm not sure, ingots. They were underpriced. They couldn't sell their ingots. The last time I checked, which frankly was a, year, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> you could buy, if you had a few bucks knocking around your pocket, you could buy a high-functioning magnesium processing facility in the eastern townships of Canada. Now, <clears throat> I'm not suggesting this is a project management failure, because I already said to you that we're going to take the narrow view that our project management is going to go from the identification of a need through requirements through to delivery against those requirements. Here in project management, we're not going to address the fundamental justification of the project or whether or not that fundamental justification proved out in the long run. And that was the issue here. But <clears throat> if they would had a gated process, it would have been a hint to senior management or line of business managers within this mining company to, at the end of each phase, not just say, are we on track to delivering a $500 million magnesium plant, but to rethink the business case. Let's just check the business case. Do we still think that the marketplace is as it was six months ago? And <clears throat> I'm told that this company, after this, they brought in a multi-gated process, partly because of that particular failing. So. <clears throat> The, the gates can be more for, than just for control of the management of the project. It can be for, you know, rechecking the uh, the business case. Yes. Yeah. So what would you do if you find out like that the business case isn't like as good or you know viable as before? Like if you're <coughs> kind of not halfway through the project, but like you've kind of like crossed the gate. <coughs> well, now I'm answering narrowly as a project manager, and as now I. I don't like to look as though I'm sh shirking responsibility, but if I'm the project manager, I think my job is at each gate to say, are we, are we achieving the scope? And um, are we gonna achieve the milestones? Do I have to change the target date? And am I on track for the budget? Am I gonna achieve the budget? It's not my job as a project manager, not typically, to say what's happening over in China or what's gonna be the market for magnesium bullion uh, you know, two years after completion. Now, it's hugely important for the organization, but I would usually say that the way we look at project management, uh, at the discipline of project management, I'm not going to address that. Now, however, in, in any particular organization, like maybe you personally in your current or future job, maybe you do have that larger span. Maybe, but that means that you're more than just a project manager as defined here in this room. And I wouldn't disagree with that. You may have a business hat, or uh, may, um, um, so that you are looking at the business. Maybe, maybe your project is to actually find out whether there's a business case. And maybe your, your project is also to have a phase later on to find out whether there's a benefit. But most commonly, we're looking at, at this span. Product eight years, you say? No, that's eight years. 
Oh, it'll take years. Yeah, yeah. Mm. If the project is is if the project will take years, I think um, uh, the person who we're going to call the project sponsor and the person who's a customer really ought to be during that project re you know continuously sort of verifying that there is in fact a benefit to the project. Um, putting gates in here can add to the, to the likelihood that somebody will in fact. Uh, go and check that. And putting in the gates also acts as a control against the project management. Is the project management going along according to plan and what are we going to be delivering? Uh, now, in, uh, this has another example here. Um, here's an example from new product development. <coughs> and that's a subset of projects. You know, it's a type of project developing a new product. <coughs> this comes from a, uh, this particular story comes from a company that <coughs> is, uh, well, they were, I'm, I'm assuming they're still around, <coughs> um, a major Canadian designer, manufacturer, and they sold high-tech scientific equipment around the world. <coughs> and they said, um, uh, they said, we discovered that for every 11, ever, for 11 new product projects that we initiate. In other words, somebody has come up with either a concept of a new product or an enhancement to an existing product. They said for every 11, many of those, pro many of those initiatives are abandoned consciously and one emerges, well consciously or not, one emerges into the marketplace as a finished product. And they said, we don't think we have very good control of this new product process. Now, it's not for me to tell new product you know, companies that design and develop new products. It's not for me to tell them how to manage those new product development projects. There is a body of knowledge of new product development. Uh, there's a professor, um, Robert Cooper at McMaster University, who's probably the world leader in new product development, doing very good research and a very personable guy, too. Um, um, and in fact, he uh, emphasizes the stage gate process. You can call it stage gate or phase gate. Is the idea of that the end of a, of, a, of a phase is a gate where you consciously decide. He's got one of them copyrighted, but I always forget which it is. So phase gate or stage gate, or some people might call it a quality gate. And uh, <clears throat> so this particular company, though, said we think we're spending too much time on initiatives that aren't going to pay out for one reason or another. And we'd like to cut back, we'd like to decide earlier. So if, if a project is eventually going to get canceled, we'd rather cancel, find ways to cancel it earlier so we can emphasize on the ones that are going to pay out. Now, again, I'm not telling new product development companies what to do, but this is something to think about. It is not unusual to follow Robert Cooper's stage gate process <coughs> where the company comes up with an idea, somebody comes up with an idea. My, um, my laser pointer doesn't work very well. The clicker feature works very well. The laser pointer doesn't work very well. And sometimes I'm going to point it and it's not going to be up there. I'm going to have the overwhelming desire to look into it and press the button please hold me back, shout out if you see me staring into my laser pointer. <clears throat> Somebody comes up with an idea. <clears throat> it goes through a gate. This is a loose, I, I gather, a, a kind of a loose early gate where people will ask certain questions. Well, is there some reason to believe that this might be adding to um, the, the capabilities? Or is there some reason to believe that customers might go for this? Now, you might say maybe that's Maybe that's too stringent. You know, maybe, uh, maybe customers might not recognize there's a use for it, for it until it's already launched, you know, which is maybe kind of the, jo the uh, what's his name, Jobs strategy. Or going back years, the, uh, you know, the post-it note was something that was developed not according to a rigorous process like this. It merged into the marketplace. Nobody thought it would sell, and it was enormously popular. But nonetheless, 
<coughs> an application of stage gates can be consciously decided by a company. <coughs> so there'd be a few questions. If it, uh, and then if it's approved, it goes into a project scoping phase, and it's understood what is a project scoping phase. We deliver the result of that, and it's a gate. And then some questions are asked, and it either passes to the next gate, goes back to the previous gate, or gets canceled. So clearly, the, and, uh, oh, as we proceed through the process, the questions become more rigorous, more like net present value kinds of questions, and they did find that they're able to successfully bring that back. Now, there is the risk. There's the risk that you cancel some initiative that might be hugely profitable. Uh, you just didn't recognize it early enough, but uh, they saw it as an advantage that they were able to make that kind of decision earlier. But this is a question for the company that's doing the new product development. <coughs> um, also, <coughs> it is true that project management as currently describes, uh, it is currently described by methods such as this and by the PMBOK guide, it is true, it's kind of a, a conservative approach. Project management in recent decades has become rather conservative and uh, control-oriented and plan-driven. So we're thoroughly planning what we're going, the implication is we're thoroughly planning what we're doing, we're checking it frequently, and we're delivering against the plan. Now, with agile project management that's emerging mainly from agile development, it is a different flavor. You know, it's more what people might call change-driven. And I'm not competent to dive into detail about agile, uh, but <clears throat> we are still at the beginning initiating and planning what we're going to do. We have uh, numerous gates at the end of relatively short phases that we call iterations. Decisions are made. It's just that the scope is not as static and it allows further changes, but still fundamentally not different generally with the project management stuff we're going to be talking about here. Um, <clears throat> you know, and also it, it, it's, it may be a little overly, um, this gating may be a little bit too overly plan driven or um, controlling for certain kinds of technology projects. If we're really advancing technology, it may be that, you know, we're trying something out, and we're trying out something else in parallel, and we're tr a lot of trial and failure as opposed to firm processes. But again, this is up to the organization to decide. Uh, the more we want to know where we're going and more control on the cost and schedule at the end, probably the more we're going to exert on these kinds of control mechanisms. If there is a stage gate, <coughs> Well, now I've erased, oh, yeah, if there is a stage gate, <coughs> we're going to say, are we still on track to, uh, you know, if they did have some further phases here, are we still on track to, uh, to deliver the scope? <coughs> is it still within the schedule and the budget? <coughs> you know, in public sector projects, I was saying, for construction projects, almost always we're going to do the complete design and... Um, uh, we're probably going to have a tendering process to get a complete cost by a general contractor to build something. And there's a gate there. We're not going to proceed unless, in fact, it is on budget and we're, you know, we're happy with the cost and schedule. You know, that's, there's more control there because that seems to generally be desired by the public sector. Uh, <coughs> and not the pro it, it would be good for the project manager to ask the question, but fundamentally it's usually somebody else's decision to decide, is it fundamentally justified? Uh, is it still, you know, is it still a priority in our portfolio? And uh, um, I have here, I mean, I know you can't read this at a distance, but there is a much more readable one in your, <coughs> in your notes. Just as an example of a project uh, of um, a method that a, might, a company might come up with, that's consistent with the stuff that we're talking about here. <clears throat> this happens to come from the government of Nunavut, because uh, several years ago, the government of Nunavut, which is our Arctic islands, of course, well, they have some mainland as well, <clears throat> they came in for criticism from the, gov from the Auditor General of Canada for some projects that have gone ahead, including some airport projects. I don't think there was any suggestion of corruption or graft or anything. It was just what the Auditor General found was poor project management and poor financial management. 
Treasury Board of Canada has, had a, has been a big pusher in recent years of more rigorous project management by departments that are spending federal money. The RCMP has responded to this by bringing in PRINCE2, the method I mentioned from the Ontario government. Uh, other departments are big on processes, project management processes. I saw a, um, um, just off, off on that tangent, I was at a presentation by the guy a few years ago, three years ago maybe, a guy who was uh, in ch the chief technology officer for the province of Ontario. And he was describing how they had just had this big initiative to design their project management method for uh, systems projects, uh, information systems projects within Ontario. Huge similarity to Prince 2. He admitted that overseas experts had been uh, consulted. He didn't use the word Prince 2, but clearly it was that way, which is you know, a very clear phase gating and, and responsibilities and decisions. Uh, so <clears throat> we happened to do a project management audit for the government of Nunavut. We happened then to, we happened then to do a carry-on um, maturity project, and we helped them design their process. Uh, the details of this process, by the way, is all hyperlinked documents and, and, uh, and templates. It's not, doc it's not as document heavy as it looks here. It is actually more user friendly to follow. And the project officers or project managers are finding it useful. They're getting more support now than they used to. <clears throat> they have a capital planning process, which really is the portfolio management, selecting which projects we want to proceed further on. <clears throat> they have a project initiation phase that leads up to a business case, which is fundamentally the, 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 the responsibility of their departmental partner who maybe wants to build a senior's home, for example. And a project budget, at least an early budget, and a project charter, which is a project management document we'll talk about. It does not go into the next phase until those are approved. <clears throat> when it does go into the next phase, um, we're uh, gathering more requirements. We're doing uh, design up to 50%. We're coming up with a project management plan. We're confirming the business case and the budget. And we're proceeding with the rest of detail design. Well, now, you see, I'm overlapping the project management language with the product language. <clears throat> and, uh, we have a tender check estimate now that's going to be a much more accurate estimate. And the project does not get approved for tendering until we're satisfied at this point. And the project still makes sense. Then we go into a construction phase and there's a closeout phase. And uh, we're very clear here on what, are, what is the work and what are the deliverables. It's sort of, it's an organization that has decided what's their project management method so they can support their project managers and their clients also understand what the process is. Any general questions or anything else before we take a break for lunch? Um, we have longer days than the usual three-hour lectures, but of course we have many fewer days. Uh, and uh, is, it, uh, is it likely that we can actually get back in an hour? Or do you think we need an hour and five minutes. I'd like to see us do it in an hour. Uh, you know, there are places, uh, it's, in fact, it's a little easier than it is on the weekends when there are eating places on campus as well as long, along College Street. Unless there's any, uh, any questions or comments, or you can also raise them when we get back. Uh, I'll, I'll be expecting uh, that the level of engagement and conversation here will increase over the next couple of days something like what it was at your team workshops earlier. And along that line, we will have some more team workshops. Good, let's get together in an hour. <clears throat>